Struggling to move your nonprofit forward? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Nonprofit Architect, where we are giving you the actionable steps you need to launch and grow your nonprofit organization. Now, here's your host, Travis Johnson. Do you feel your nonprofit's not getting enough in monthly recurring donations? If so, then you need sharing the credit. Every time you go into a business and swipe your debit or credit card, one of the fees taken out by Visa and MasterCard at the end of the month goes back into the system. Now, normally this is a bank, but it is legally allowed to go to a registered nonprofit. Sharing the credit worked with a small local nonprofit. They took this information to their donor base and 19 businesses started using sharing the credit. Now, this small local nonprofit receives $11,000 in monthly recurring, unrestricted, ongoing donations. This is the definition of sustainable funding. Businesses have to take plastic, so they might as well use part of those fees to support their favorite cause, your nonprofit. Check out my affiliate link in the show notes for sharing the credit. Book a call with Will Black and start your journey to more donations and better relationships today. Hey, welcome to the show. I'm sitting here today with Claire Crum from Calm Ops. Claire, how are you today? I am doing good, Travis. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. The sun is shining. I think all the weather in the Midwest is in your neck of the woods and not in mine. So I'm pretty happy about it. There was huge storms like in Shreveport and all that stuff last night. There was some pretty big stuff here in Kansas City too. We have crazy wind and today's kind of dreary and that's all right. We need moisture and springs around the corner. So things are looking up. It's a great day to be on a podcast. I'll tell you what. Absolutely. Hey, tell us a little, the audience, a little bit about, you know, who you are and what it is that you do, Claire. Sure. So I started out in the nonprofit sector 15 plus years ago, and I was in event planning and volunteer management and general cat herding, because that is kind of what you do when you're working in small startup nonprofits. The first one that I worked for was one and a half employees and I was the half. So I'm very familiar with the situation where folks are wearing all of the hats. And when you're in a position where you have to be your most efficient self, because there's lots of things pulling you in all of the directions. I had a number of years where I was blessed to be able to stay home with my kids and do a lot of volunteering in that time. And Today, I actually work again with nonprofits and also social enterprise organizations with my team to help them optimize their operations using resources that they already have. Well, I find that I believe about 95% of that. There's no way you've been doing this for 15 years. What are you like 10 when you got started? You are such a doll. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yes, I absolutely do. She, she told me, so just, you know, people listening, she told me that, you know, in our little pre-interview and I was like, there's no way, there's no way you're even over 30. So apparently I'm mistaken, but she's okay with that. I like to be wrong just about as many times as I possibly can be. So what is Calm Ops and what is it that you all do? Calm Ops is our operations support agency. So we work with the organizations that we work with that are all doing good. So my passion is to put more good out into the world. And I had never wanted to be pigeonholed in doing that with just one cause because there's so many things that we need to be doing um, to be helpful in the society that we're in. So we work with lots of different mission-driven organizations to help them move forward, primarily in the areas of planning, process, and projects. So we work with organizations on strategic planning elements in a really tactical way to make sure that they are on track to hitting their objectives on a week-by-week setup. So we get really in the nitty-gritty when we do that with our organizations. And we do a lot with process. So we come in and we help you create optimize, document all the things that help you do what you do so that you are doing them in the most efficient way possible, which means that you're stretching dollars, you're stretching team capacity, you're making a bigger impact without more output. And when we help with projects, uh, that is because oftentimes when we work in these other capacities, 
opportunities, we find that organizations could use a little bit of extra hands around for different things. And so we aim to be available to help with those projects. Uh, we don't want to be an extra to do on somebody's list. We aim to work in parallel with the organization so that we're moving the needle as much as we can in our time together. Oh, I like that. Yeah, you come alongside and take a lot of the, the heavy lifting out of the equation so they can actually focus on what's really important. I know that a lot of startup nonprofits, even heck, even a lot of uh, solopreneurs out there that really have an enormous amount of things to do in a day, so many hats to wear. You know, if they wrote their own book, it would say janitor and CEO, my journey through the whatever it is that they're doing, because that's really what it is. You're doing so much. You're wearing all the hats and it's just so hard if you don't know exactly what it is that you're doing and how to do it to do all the things. And even if you can do all the things, you're so darn tired at the end of the day, you don't have any energy left for your family or for fun. And those are my two favorite efforts, family and fun. You got to have time for that stuff. Yes, absolutely. It's all about intention, right? You have to know what why you are doing what you're doing, not only for the organization, but what you are here to do and what are all of the different pieces in your life that are priority and how can you make that happen? Um, There are many, many demands on us as humans, um, particularly in this sector. And so it really takes some puzzling to figure out how you can be most effective in those areas that are priority for you. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I know what type of person I am. I know that I'm the bigger picture guy, the visionary, the you know, the face of my organization. I don't do my own editing. I've got a team for that. I don't create my own products in my garage in my free time because I don't have any free time. So I've got people that help me with that. I don't make my own audiograms. I don't make my own transcripts. I have people that do that alongside of me because I know that I can't get it done. When you are starting up a nonprofit, there's just a disgusting amount of things that people say, oh, you have to do this. You have to do that. I don't know how have to do those things are, but if you could do them all, it sure would help. So Claire, what do you, when you come into an organization, you come alongside them, what are people calling? I know they're they're helping with planning and projects and processes, but what usually gets tackled first when you come in to help out? Yes. So oftentimes we start with strategic planning. And when we do that, we look at three key things when we start mission, vision, and values of the organization. Oftentimes you have those elements sort of in place, but we want to look at them with a really, really fine. We're going to go over them with a fine tooth comb to make sure that everything is dialed in because paying close attention to those elements helps to provide a compass rose for everything else in our work together, as well as the work of the organization. Because when you're not clear on those pieces, you have a tendency to take on superfluous activities and say yes to projects that are maybe a little bit outside the scope of your mission. And so ultimately what ends up happening is you dilute your impact. And so we start there And then we can plan in that intentional way, the objectives that are going to get you closer to meeting those goals that you have set out to do. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Those things are like mission creep that sound great to do and you want to do them, but they're really kind of out scope of what you have designed. Do you want to do 20 things kind of sort of, or do you want to do two or three things really, really, really well? And I know that Claire has shared with us how to do this. If you go to strategyforcalm.com slash workbook, there's a mission, vision, and values workbook for you can download for free and go through that. Uh, Probably give up your first name and your email, but uh, free gift from Claire. Go check that out. If you're not sure if what you're doing is aligned with your mission, vision, and values, you shouldn't be doing it. I know that I have my own personal mission, vision, and values for myself I have different ones for my family. I have different ones for my company, different ones for my podcast. And people are like, Travis, isn't that a lot of work? Eh, It's not a lot of work if you've got the right workbook to work from, that's for sure. And it's foundational work, really. You can go a long way, but to go the right way, you really need to have paid um, a good amount of attention to those pieces so that you're sure that your actions are moving you closer to what it is that you have said. It really, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm here to do. It's easy to get distracted. 
things pop up all the time. If you know Mike Claire, I'm going to share a little bit about my year this year. It has been a hectic year. My wife had brain surgery. I retired from the Navy. My daughter got married. My wife's grandmother died. There was a birth in the family. I had a course approved at the university level for podcasters. Like been a busy year. We had like six cross country trips and it's a lot to process. Any one of those things can take down a person, can take down a family. And we're not magical by any means. But when that stuff started happening, we focused in on the things that we can control, the things that we actually needed to do. And we let things happen just in the right time as they popped up. There's no possible way I can handle all that stuff in a single day. When you're staring at something like that and they're all stacked up staring at you, it's impossible to overcome. But if you look at them over the space and time that they exist in, you really only have to deal with the closest alligator to the boat. The thing that's going to eat you next is the thing that you have to take care of. And so (laughs) your wife's recovering from surgery. I'm here. My daughter says she's getting married and staring down retirement. And grandma dies all in the same week. I about lost it. I called my dad. I said, what's going on? This is crazy. Man, my daughter wants to get married in eight days. My retirement's coming up. And we hung up the phone and he called me back five minutes later. He's like, oh no, this is a perspective thing here. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, what a gift you've been given for your daughter to get married in eight days. I was like, what do you mean gift? I need, I need more. Tell me more. He's like, you're not spending 11 months planning a wedding. You're not spending thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on a venue. If this is going to happen in eight days, you save months of headaches and you really only spend, you know, maybe two or three grand and it's all said and done. I was like, that is a fantastic way to look at it. He's like, this other stuff you're worried about, this is going to happen whether you want it to or not. There's nothing you can do about it. This thing you have to wait on, there's nothing you can do about today. In fact, the only thing you really need to do is take care of your wife and the other stuff is going to unfold as it comes along. And I was like, oh man. What a great piece of advice, a little little dose of perspective to get things back in order. And that kind of sounds like what it is that you do with Calm Ops. Yeah. And what a great example of the values that you're living with what's really important to you, right? I think that that's amazing. And the fact that you had done some of that work really helped you to come back and say, yep, that is what I want to do. And so when you have taken some time to identify those pieces, it becomes easier when you're in those moments that you need the clarity to, to just look back and say, well, this is what I said. And so now I just have to live that thing rather than spend a bunch of time ruminating and questioning and, you know, just really being confused in the situation. It's really a compass that we have to help us move through all of the work that we're doing. And so, you know, certainly that's where we start, but then you do have big goals and objectives and maybe they're set for you by your board or if you're the solo printer, you have, you know, you're visioning all of these amazing things in the world. And so the next thing that we tell people to do is to get it all out, right? So that, you know, you're taking all of those mental post-it notes and you're getting them out in front of you so that you can evaluate them based on your mission, your vision, and your values. So are these objectives, are these things that I'm working towards pointed in that direction? Or are they, you know, a little bit off course? It becomes a lot easier then to pare down the work that you're doing and synthesize it in a way that maximizes the impact that you're making with your business or your organization or your life. No, oh, absolutely. There's, when I, when I think of like mission, vision and values, like the mission statement itself, I got to say to the people listening, some of y'all getting crazy with these mission statements. You're having like subsection B, you have paragraph nine of whatever. Please, dear Lord, move the bulk of that conversation into your vision statement if that's what you're talking about. There's organizations out there like TED, two words, spread ideas is their mission statement. Two words, spread ideas. And you can fit a lot underneath that umbrella. So if you're thinking about what your mission is, or you're trying to rework it, or you're trying to start a nonprofit, don't get crazy with it. (laughs) If you can't say it in one succinct sentence and have everyone understand what it is that you do, I think you're doing it wrong. Has that been your experience, Claire? Yes. And I would say that you want it to be, you do want it to be specific um, enough that someone can tie that to your organization. So the way that I teach folks to look at these pieces, your mission is going to be that forward facing element that is really going to allow your constituents, your community, your investors to be 
your cheerleaders. So that's what's going to get them behind you is that big piece. Your vision, however, doesn't have to be public facing. That can be for you. That can be internal. And it has some of those more targeted goals that are specific that says, you know, we want to reach 10,000 people in the next five years with this program that we have set up, or we want to increase our fundraising numbers to this level in this period of time. So those are the pieces that get a little bit more targeted and they're those, those bigger goals. Um, values seems pretty easy, right? And so I think sometimes it gets overlooked, but those are important, you know, not just for your own personal compass, but particularly if you have a team and whether that team is employees or contractors or even volunteers, we're seeing in the workplace right now more and more that folks really want to understand who they're working for and what they stand for, because that is where we can kind of meet and get really excited together about the work that we're doing. And so it's really important to take some time and determine, you know, what are the values that we want to live by within our organization, because those are going to dictate the culture that you create within your organization. And if you don't think that that's an important piece to making a big impact in the world, then we have another conversation we have to have. (laughs) (laughs) What what people often forget, especially if they're the founders with so much work that has to be done to run this thing, they forget how important the vision is not to them, but to the organization, to all the people. If you have someone checking and sending emails, the task itself is pretty mundane, pretty benign, not too exciting or extravagant. But if they understand the vision and how the tasks and things that they are doing feed into and help create that vision, and you remind them on a, my opinion, Claire might disagree, no less than weekly basis. If you're not well, reminding them of your vision. You know, like yeah. have a banner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, have, a banner, have a banner. Have a banner. Talk about it. Understand what it is that we're really doing, because it's really easy to get lost in the forest. It really is. I I started my career in the Navy, you know, fixing airplanes, and you know, you watch Top Gun, you see him fly off the end of the flight deck, you see him do cool stuff, and I've got to do that. But while you're in it, you're like, oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do 14 dailies. I've got to check all these airplanes. I've got to hike this liquid oxygen converter that weighs like 60 pounds around and put it in. I can make sure all these jets are good. And you get lost in all the things that you have to do and you lose sight of the bigger picture of what you're there to do, who you're there to protect, how the thing that you're doing interacts and does with the mission. And when we lose sight of that, that's when morale starts drop. And when we lose sight of that, that's where people become unengaged, disengaged, or become problem children because they're not understanding how their role fits in the overall machine. Yeah, absolutely. And I think many of us have been in a position where we have felt that way. And so that that's where you can reflect on that, right? We as individuals want to be part of something bigger. That's It's meaningful for us as humans to have that. And so you want to offer that opportunity to the people that are giving their time to come and work with you on this mission. And so do them that service to be clear is to be kind. Um, And that really helps them, you know, get excited about the work that they're doing and doing a good job. But you have to think it goes beyond um, the office desk or the virtual space. They have colleagues, they have friends, they have social media. And if they're excited about the mission, then the vision that you are working towards as an organization, they're going to be more apt to share that and bring more people in as well. So, you know, it, it's a it's bigger than, you know, just making sure that these tasks get checked off. Um, it's really about building more cheerleaders for your organization and making other people feel supported in that. Oh, absolutely. You create some a work environment where the employees are on fire for what they're doing. Just, <laughs> just get them fired up and, and get out of their way. Get them fired up, get out of their way, let them go do all of that stuff. That's what's really going to take your organization to the next level. If you think you can do it off your own uh, blood, sweat, and tears, your own effort, you're just living in the wrong time, my friend, living in the wrong time. So you guys offer full operation support. I was looking through like the laundry list of things that you do, and I'm going to list them here real quick because I took notes and I feel very studious. They includes decision support, hiring support, project management, metrics tracking, meeting facilitations, operations process, that's that SOP setup and the maintenance. And you've got admin, test tech, implementation, uh, and strategic mapping. That's like a whole, that's like a whole department 
That is what we aim to be, is a whole department. (laughs) You know, so often within the organizations that we work with, they need that foundational support, right? Nonprofits and startups alike have a tendency to be so focused on output and programming that some of this operational stuff can end up on the back burner. But unfortunately, what happens when you don't pay attention to some of those foundational elements is you cap the level of impact that you can create. So there, you can only scale to a certain degree without having some of these systems and processes in place. And so what we aim to do is come in and help with those pieces um, to be available, whether it is on a consulting basis or with direct implementation to make sure you have those solid foundations. And maybe that's just as a project, or maybe there is a longer retainer piece that is needed and we can help with that too. Oh yeah, without a doubt. You know, when I stare at this laundry list of things, I wonder in my organization, which of these things I'm missing or which of these things that I need help with, no matter what organization it is, everyone has blind spots, things that they don't know that they're missing, don't know that they don't know. And it's just so hard to even know where to put your time, especially if you're doing this alone. I've got a lot of friends that are running uh, solo nonprofits, even though, right, your board's running it, but they're like two people you never talk to and you're just kind of doing this on your own. It is so hard to create something that's sustainable and sustainable in my mind is 10 years or longer to create a sustainable organization that's going to do these things in your absence. No matter how you feel about your mission today, there might come a time where you're no longer as passionate about it and be like, Travis, this is lies. It it might be lies. It might be lies for you, right? But there for sure is going to come time where you're going to want to take a vacation. There is for sure going to become a time where you're tired or need a break or you get sick or God forbid or in the hospital or a family member becomes ill and you can't be the person that does the thing that day, that week, that month. And if you don't create and build up all these different things, all these different programs, processes, procedures, and build up your team and train them, they're not going to be able to do this if you're having a bad day. And I know people in the nonprofit space like to run themselves through the ringer. The pain of service is what they live for. It's beyond me. I don't understand it, right? (laughs) I'm wanting to be excited and energized and be able to give my all every day. So I'm giving myself time to rest, time to recuperate. And I give my replacements the training and support they need to be successful without me in the room. Yes, because it's really a legacy that you're building, right? And so a legacy is something that will outlast you. And how do you how do you get from point A where you're at now, where you're wearing all of the hats and you're feeling burnt out to point Z, which is you have the sustainable organization that you get to be a supporter of. of rather than a worker be in. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. What, uh, so I'm looking at this list of things, your full operation support. What do you mean by decision support? What is that? Oh, you know, sometimes we just get in our heads about things, right? And there's so many opportunities that are out there and shiny objects and squirrels that need chasing. And as visionaries, we're so apt to go after all of those things. And sometimes you just need a sounding board and somebody that can actively listen and objectively listen to where you're at and help you through that process um, and say, hey, you know, that mission that you said that you're working towards, um, that goal that you have laid out in your vision, are we sure that this decision is supporting those ends? Maybe yes, maybe no. But sometimes you need that extra level of support to come to that clarity. There's something called, uh, see, you know, I lost it right when I said there's something called, I'm going to think about it, opportunity cost. There it is. For every opportunity that's out there, it costs you something to say yes to that opportunity. It costs time, energy, effort, might cost money. And when you're using that on that new opportunity, you won't have it for other things that you were doing or different opportunities. So just because something comes up and is part of the conversation doesn't mean that it meets your mission, doesn't mean it's the way forward for you, doesn't mean it's worth your time, energy, effort, or anything. Or you're like, oh yeah, Travis, we got that down and we say no to everything. For those of you who say no to everything or have gigantic amounts of red tape in your organization, some of you all need to take some of these opportunities, give it a chance to work for you and see how it goes. And by give it a chance, I don't mean three months. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. There, there's a spectrum of, you know, how to be excited about and take on new opportunities, whether that is not at all, or, you know, I'm going all in and I'm funding the whole thing. There's a lot of gray that you can kind of play in with different opportunities that come your way. Absolutely. You also mentioned in here hiring support. How does someone in a nonprofit, how do they determine and decide that they are going to pay employees? Well, that becomes a bigger piece with the org, within the org structure. So, you know, you want to take into consideration where you're at right now, where you want to be, certainly, and what what are you going to need to support the vision that is the big vision? And then we walk it backwards and say, okay, with in a year, where do we need to be to be meeting those goals? And so we look at that backwards view to decide what we can be doing today to support those ends. So oftentimes that means that there's team members that are key elements to bring in right now that would free up a founder to do additional fundraising development in order to bring on then the next team member. So we want to look at it in a really strategic way to bring the right people on at the right time. What would you say to the people that don't have any paid employees and don't plan on getting any? I would say, look at your mission and mission and values (laughs) to determine if that makes sense for where it is that you want to go. Because I think in some instances, that can be a sustainable option because maybe you have some volunteers or you have some contractors or some folks that can support to a certain end. But if you're looking to do something bigger, then long-term, you probably are looking at having some more support on your side. And there's things that you can be doing right now to be prepared to bring that support your way. Mm -hmm. I know founders out there that their goal is to support a million people. And they also believe it's wrong to hire employees in a nonprofit. I don't believe that those two statements are in alignment. I think they are mutually exclusive. I'm getting, I'm getting a North and South. I'm getting a head nod here. Claire, what's, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Can you help a million people with volunteers only no paid employees in theory? No, in theory, but I think, you know, think about the sustainability of that with the people that are helping you, right? If you, how, how dedicated would a volunteer need to be to support to that end? And what is their, what is their time worth, right? What is your time worth as a founder? I think that you're not looking at creating a very sustainable organization without added stability of something like an employee. Um, Volunteers are amazing support to organizations that came out of volunteer management. So I have a lot of respect for what they do, but there's going to be turnover. You know, they, they have other obligations. And so they can't be fully committed um, to your organization in the way that employees will be. And so it's important to bring those people on in a way that will be supportive, not only to the organization, but for them as the team members coming in to support you. Yeah, I I fully believe that. I did an interview with Karen Knight. We talked all about uh, volunteers and volunteer management. And it's just so interesting to see the way some people look at volunteers. And I have a lot of things I can say about it, but I've said it on like five or six other episodes. So I'm not going to repeat myself here. But (laughs) volunteers are valuable. Volunteers aren't likely to stick around forever. Certainly not longer than maybe two years. You have to figure out. They're not free labor. They're not free labor. They're They're not just there to build your vision. Yeah. Yeah. There are catalysts within your organization that can be of help, but you have to support them and you have to do good by them in order for them to be at their best for your organization. Oh, absolutely. I love this other thing you do here, metrics tracking. This has come up a lot lately, especially in the service space. People don't even know what they're tracking or why. What do you look at when you look into metrics tracking? What does that look like for you and your team? What is it that you're trying to track? Because that's the piece that a lot of people get wrong is they think they need to track everything. But if it is not something that is giving you direct insight to how close a piece is moving towards the goals that you have set within your vision or within your objectives for the year, then you don't need to stress about it. Um, in my opinion, I think there's too many people that get caught in numbers and it's kind of, it it feels busy and like we're doing a lot of stuff, but it's actually the implementation and doing work that 
makes the numbers go the directions that you want them to do. And so that's where you really need to be focused. But the data can be really helpful when it comes to deciding what kind of decisions that we want to make. So you want to have the right indicators for what it is that you're trying to get data on. Yeah, it's very interesting. When I look at something like the podcasting world and I look at at sponsors and I, of course, like to have sponsors, right? People giving me money and me promoting their thing that they want to do. Uh, I got reached out to by um, a photographer in Tennessee and he wanted to do ads on my show. That's great and all. But when I look at my numbers at the time, I had like 30 downloads in all of Tennessee. And this is a photographer that does things in person. It would have been wrong and irresponsible of me to take his money, knowing that I really wasn't delivering the value to him and what he's doing. So even though I can track my download numbers and I can say what this big fancy number is, that doesn't help him in Tennessee for what he's trying to do. So it does does him no good to look at all of my numbers and think it's great for him when it really has almost nothing to do with him. Do you find that Nonprofits are tracking things that they just have no business tracking. I would say that 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 is accurate. Yeah, Um, because it's hard to know if it's not something that you're familiar with going in. You know, lots of folks in nonprofit are learning a lot on the fly. um, And there's a lot of talking heads out there that are telling us how to do particular things. But again, if there's pieces that need to be tracked, they should tell you something directly about the work that you are doing and how you are doing that work. Um, so, you know, key performance indicators is KPIs are the kinds of things that we would track. And so, you know, that might be uh, donations from a certain perspective, but maybe that's donations per volunteer, you know, or by individuals in your organization. Um, looking at those kinds of things then helps you read data in an appropriate way. So if I'm a local nonprofit in, I don't know, Kansas City, I'm just getting started. What do I need to track? I would track things related to your development and your programming. And if there are specific operational goals that you need. So if there is funds, like a certain funding goal, and obviously you're going to track the you know, how are we doing towards that funding goal month over month, quarter over quarter? If there are programming goals of people that you want specifically in your program, then you would track things like applications into the program versus people that have finished the program, those kinds of things. There are going to be data points that you're going to need for grants and and things like that. So it becomes kind of a specialized conversation, but You know, the key being be judicious and don't feel like you have to track everything. Do you have an example from one of your clients you can share? Don't share the client name, but what type of organization and what are some things that you help them track? Yes. So we worked with an international nonprofit organization that had chapters all over the place. What group of people were they helping? They were helping a a broad population. So it's a public listening project. So they had volunteers that would literally go out onto the streets and set up their camp chairs and offer free listening. It was a really, it was a beautiful project. And so things that we tracked were specific to chapters. So how many folks came by, we would teach the chapter leaders how to track that so that they could determine which site was best for them to be at. So they had the most listening. Some of the things that we were tracking came from surveys that were filled out by both volunteer listeners and also talkers that would come in because there was some research that was being done on those elements. So we got their their feedback on how they were feeling pre and post listening experience. But we would also track things like engagement with our chapter leaders. How many events were they hosting? Were they, you know, consistently building their volunteer base locally? Those kind of things helped us to determine, you know, what support did we need to provide those chapters so that they could be successful? What what did successful chapters have that maybe less active chapters needed? And so when we looked at those pieces, that helped us really determine how to build up that chapter support program. Yeah, absolutely. It's like looking at numbers on social media 
And you're like, how many people saw my stuff? How many people engaged? How many people commented? And if it was something that I needed done, like a form filled out of all those people in my group, how many actually filled out the form? Was it the presentation of the form? Was it the fact that it was digital? Were people actually reading this stuff or are they just scrolling on by? Are the things that you're trying to implement actually gaining traction on a level that you think is valuable to your organization? Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Because the key there was how many people filled out the form. So if you have a big discrepancy there, that's a piece of data that will tell you, okay, we probably need to switch something up here because this is not matching up. Yeah, exactly. If you are looking at getting new donors or closing new business, and you know that you talked to a hundred people and you got four to sign up and they signed up for an average of $50 each, and you're trying to make $1,000, that's only at 200. So then you do the math backwards to figure out how many more people you need to talk to at that closing rate in order to reach your goal. If you don't look at those types of numbers in order to reach your goal, you'll have no idea how many people you need to talk to in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year in order to reach that goal, whether it's nonprofit and donations, whether it's business and selling products or services, or anything that you're trying to do. The number of people you are talked to, to set appointments from appointments, to getting a yes from the yes to the funds getting an account and then the average value of those accounts. And maybe that meets your goal, but maybe you find out when you do that math that it's going to take you years to hit the number of what you're going to hit. And so that's when reality starts to set in and you say, oh, okay, well, maybe what I need to do is refine my pitch deck, whether that is for donations or individuals. So that what I'm bringing in with each individual that I convert ends up getting me closer to my goal faster. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Maybe it's the type of people that you're talking to. I know a lot of veteran organizations out there, their messaging is only to veterans. You're asking veterans to bail out federal veterans. Nothing wrong with that, but you wouldn't go into a homeless population, ask for 50 bucks from everybody to try to then build a house for the homeless. You go to a different group of people other than the people that you're trying to help. Maybe you realize that you've set 12 appointments and you've had hours worth of calls and they didn't really get you anything because those people didn't actually have you any money to either pay you for your products or services or money to donate towards your goal. So you might find yourself looking for a different group of people that are going to help you reach your goals. Exactly. Exactly. It's just reading. It's reading data. Reading data. <laughs> How, how many people simple, in the audience, how many that. people in the audience just cringed <laughs> with those two words, reading data? If you cringed for that, call Claire, get on her calendar, get her in your organization so you don't have to read that stuff, please. Don't cringe. Don't ignore the data just because, just because it made, it made you, uh, I didn't, yeah, uh, I didn't put a warning on this episode, uh, cringeworthy. I didn't put that on our, our marketing materials. You have things in here like meeting facilitation. Do people not know how to run a meeting? Not always at the most effective, but this is something that we do typically with our retainer clients. We can come in and be the person so that the founder doesn't have to be the person. Sometimes there's pieces like that that need to be off of somebody's plate. So that can be running meetings, but that can also be setting up meeting cadences and processes so that that feels like a supportive and sustainable helpful thing for the organization. And that might mean not having so many meetings. That's, that's something that we might sometimes recommend also. <laughs> you know, I talked to a local nonprofit here in Oklahoma City and we were having lunch and he was going through some of his materials. And I was like, hey, what, what are you working on? He's like, oh, we've got a board meeting later tonight. I'm getting stuff together for the board members to read. And I said, hey, brother, are you putting together a 45 page document to have people read during the meeting. And he's like, yeah, we always do it this way. Oh my Lord. How much time is spent in the meeting watching other people read a document? What does your board member turnover look like? I, <laughs> it's all data, right? Yeah, oh yeah, it's all that. I, I was like, I was like, Hey, how about you do them a favor and send them a read ahead so they can come to the meeting with questions and then the person, if you can collect questions ahead of time and have the person working on this project be prepared to present answers to these questions instead of staring at each other, finishing a reading, we read at different rates and we have different retention and like you can't expect someone to sit in a meeting and read a 45 page document 
have any other understanding of it. And then like they're already tired from sitting there and reading. What does that meeting look like? How do you make how do you make an effective meeting? Well, as you mentioned, you want to have things prepared as much as you can going into the meeting because the meeting itself should be about making decisions, doing things, collaborating in a way that can't be done outside of the meeting. You know, how many of us have seen the, this could have been an email meme. As much as we can, we try to keep the important things on the agenda and move the status pieces out of a meeting. Um, If you have a project management tool set up effectively, that can be a great way to provide information, certainly giving them the information that they need in packets ahead of time so people can process that. What I like to keep within the meeting are things like what is working, what is not, what is missing, what is confusing. I think that that's one great, you know, kind of agenda and things can fall within there. But as much as possible, keep the meeting to things that need to be done in person with folks. What do you think one of the pitfalls is for executive directors briefing meetings, briefing how their departments are going, how their projects are doing? What do you think are some of the pitfalls of that setup? You know, I think that they want to show progress and they want to have board members know where everything is at. And so, you know, they want to tell them everything that is going on all right here in this meeting. But then that kind of handicaps their ability to have forward motion within the meeting too. Those kinds of status things are pieces that you can present ahead of time. And if your board is an engaged board, then they're going to stay up to date with those pieces. But certainly there are some internal things that that don't need to be with the board. Um, So I would say in that instance, question why am I bringing this information into this meeting? Is it necessary for this reason? Or is there something that I am, uh, an outcome that I'm trying to reach by presenting that information? And is this really the best way to do that? Yeah, I was having a conversation earlier today and we were talking about some of the fallacies of board meetings. And one of the things that come up were people that would only show up and present like the rosiest picture of what they're doing. And we're avoiding bringing any problems that needed solutions or decisions into the board. And I really think that's a poor way to present because when, if you're struggling with whatever it is that you're struggling with, I don't think that briefing that means you are not doing a good job. I mean, you should come in there with potential solutions that the board would need to decide on. But if you wait for the problem to get so big and it blindsides the board, I think you're pretty much guaranteed to be fired. Uh, That's just the way I look at it. What do you think, Claire? Yeah, I would agree. It's about being transparent all the way through. And the more that we can do that, the more that we can interact as humans in a professional way. And, you know, you you have to have all the cards on the table for everybody to be engaged and productive um, at their best. And so if you're not giving them that information, then you're doing not only yourself, but the organization a disservice. Because to your point, when things get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, they get harder to solve. And so let's bring some problem solving folks together to help work through things. Uh, I'm going to reveal some of my age here. I've been watching the original Saved by the Bell on Netflix again. And I don't remember if I'd seen all the episodes or not, but there's always like some scheme that Zach Morris is bringing up and it always involves misinformation, lack of information or lying. And the moral of almost every single episode is if I just would have been up front with people, I could have avoided this huge mess. And it's a novel idea. It's, um, it's like in every single episode of Saved by the Bell. If only I wouldn't be so shady. If only I would have been upfront with how I feel about the situation. If only I would have told the truth or taken care of my responsibility. You know, I heard that the, the truth is always the, the best. And it's a lot easier to be truthful if you're not doing shady things. That's just the way I look at it. I don't know. Last on this list, I'm reading here that you do admin and, and tech task implementations, and you've got some automation things that you do. How do you help uh, alleviate some of that administrative burden? We come in and we have administrative people that can help with little things. And so sometimes that looks like 
a retainer package where we're literally the bridge um, because sometimes you're planning on maybe bringing an employee in in the long term for operational folks. I think that that's where you want to go ultimately. Um, but when you need somebody that can help with some of these basic things right now, or as a solopreneur, you're like, I just really need to get some of these things off of my plate. Then we have the infrastructure in place to be able to support in those ways um, because it's not all big. Sometimes there are just little needly things that you need to have some space away from. And so we strive to be able to help in those areas too. So it's that full operate general operations department. That's, that's what we do. Yeah. I tell you, I use some, some different automation tools. Like I use MailChimp for my, my emails and I've used like IFTTT, if this, then that, if, if I have a new episode that publishes, then it automatically gets promoted on this social media. Uh, and there's a few things that I have set up and it saved me a lot of headache and a lot of time. And right now I'm staring at some admin tasks that I've been kind of, you know, putting off, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, I've had a lot going on this year. And so like, as the machine keeps running and new episodes come out week after week after week, I noticed that I hadn't been promoting them. I hadn't been putting out some of the things and I hadn't been creating the blog post. I had been creating the blog post, and I'm like, it is high time that I teach someone else on my team to do this for just that reason that I was busy with other life things. and I wasn't able to get those done. And I didn't have that redundancy, that backup plan, that training in place to get those done. And it sounds like that's exactly what you offer. We do. Yep. So we can do some of those implementation pieces. I think that, you know, automations is a great example because I think that's something that is underutilized in the nonprofit space. Um, so certainly we can help get some of that stuff set up so that you're working smarter and not harder. Um, but we also want to help to prepare an organization to have those kinds of people come in and help them on a long-term basis. And so that might be coming in, yes, to help with the tasks, but also to document what that process looks like. So when you have somebody coming in for the long-term, they're really set up for success because you, you know, when you have to delegate things, sometimes that feels hard because you have to train somebody and boy, I don't have time to do that. And how do I just download all of this stuff out of my brain and have somebody else do that? So we really aim to help the organizations and entrepreneurs that we work with to be prepared to delegate to team members as well. So that that is a sustainable operation that and culture that they're creating when they bring team members on. Hmm. Oh, absolutely. I know the things that I do that I've offloaded, like the next time that I do it, I record it and then I walk through the thing that I'm doing and then why I'm doing that thing at the way that I'm doing it. And then usually I take a screenshot of the thing and I put it in like paint or in Canva and make little arrows and say, this is where this comes from. This is where this section comes from. This is this. This is how I determine this. And then when someone comes in to do that, instead of me doing it, they can look at the template and watch the video of the thing that I've created and pretty close to the first or second time we, we get it done. They know exactly how to do it, what's expected, where to get the information, and then I don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. And that's a really great way to be supportive to your team member, but also to yourself. So oftentimes people don't have that kind of a thing in place. And what ends up happening is you have a team member who wants to do a good job, but they haven't really had expectations set for them really clearly. And so they don't do the job quite as you thought they would. And so then you're disappointed, but really, you know, there was that miscommunication piece. So as clear and as upfront as we keep talking about, um, as you can be the better. Yeah, Claire is definitely kind. I know that when you look at basic leadership skills, you want to know, like, is the person capable? Have they been trained? Have I allowed them to do it? And have I given my expectations? Expectations might be look like, hey, by the end of the day, I'd like you to have this done to 50% completion, or I'd like to have called at least five donors and followed up and see how their experience went or whatever the metric is. If you don't give them a task and a purpose for doing that, I need you to do this in order to accomplish this. If you don't give them that piece, the what they have to do in the expectation, they won't know what it is to do. Too many job descriptions I see out there is you have to have skills in this and be able to do this and be proficient with words or have a master's degree. That's great and all, but just because that person gets hired 
doesn't mean they have any clue of how you do things or what you expect. A project in their last job might be, oh yeah, you know, sometime over the next three weeks, get this done. But what you mean is if it's not done before lunch, I'm going to have a huge problem and throw a fit. You have to set that expectation for what that looks like in your organization because people don't know unless you tell them. Absolutely. And it comes down to self-awareness, really. I'm the kind of person that is the antithesis of a micromanager. And I just, to my detriment, sometimes I assume you got something unless you don't got it. But what I have done to counteract that in myself is to make sure that I'm being really clear. I have a checklist to make sure I have given them all the pieces of information. I haven't left anything out. And then we also have systems in place to double check. So what is done really look like? As Brene Brown says, paint done in her book, Dare to Lead, which is amazing. Not looking for stick figure level. We're looking for Van Gogh level done. Let them know to that degree so that there's no confusion. You know, everybody's really clear and you can do that in a kind way. It doesn't mean you're that boss just because you lay out direct um, objectives. That's actually the kinder thing to do. Yeah. And leaving things ambiguous is just a recipe for misfelt expectations. I know that when my wife drives, she expects everyone else to be a good driver and she gets disappointed a lot. She gets frustrated. I expect everyone to uh, cut me off, stop short, give me the finger. And when they don't, I have a great time on the road, all due to my expectations. <laughs> Always setting expectations appropriately. That is key. <laughs> yeah. I have a group of friends that talk about the other side of that and setting intentions as opposed to expectations. What do I expect out of this meeting? What do I intend to bring to the meeting? I maybe I want to show up with a positive attitude, ready to listen to different opinions and try to learn something new and be engaging. Yeah. If I yeah. go in there with intentions... I usually walk away feeling great about what I've brought to the table. Yeah. And you have control over that piece, right? We don't always have control over other folks, but we can, we can bring our own intentions and positivity and what, you know, the energy that we want to bring into our work with other folks. So. Absolutely. Claire. I know I have a hard time believing you're older than 25, but we talked about a lot of stuff today. We talked about being a certified director of operations, herding cats, what it looks like when you come in and help people with their mission, vision, and value statement, all the different things that you guys provide. Where is the best place for people to find you? Well, certainly you can come to the website anytime and reach out. That's calm-ops.com. Or I would love if you would come and find me. That's where I'm talking about things that I'm up to and what's going on in the world of operations that could be helpful and we'll connect and see what's going on. Oh, that's fantastic, Claire. I'll have all those links for you in the show notes. So you can't get it wrong. You can just click on the one you want to go to. Reach out to Claire. I'm sure she would love to hear from you. Claire, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you so much for having me, Travis. This was a lot of fun. You've been listening to The Nonprofit Architect. To listen to all our past shows, visit nonprofitarchitect.org. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show. Thank you.